the reach of Wall Street goes well beyond the banks themselves. You know, wh where, where there start to be problems is when that over leverage extends to their corporate customers, that over leverage goes from the big companies to the smaller companies, it becomes international. And that's where they are actually pushing that risk um, away from, from them, but also more into the system. Um, and that's definitely happening. And will there be a moment where that all falls apart again? Um, it, it, it absolutely can happen. And, it, and, and, and the way in which it would happen um, is that all of this extra, all these extra la uh, layers of debt um, you know, as you mentioned, on you know, whether it's a zombie company on corporate balance sheets, on international um, balance sheets, uh, governments that are sort of not as able to produce money as the U.S. or some of the larger nations can, like all all of this can create um, a ripple effect of of risk. And Wall Street's always in the middle of it um, and driving it because the the money first goes to them before it goes into the rest of the system. <laughs>
and the relativity relative to what their wages are and, and everything else continues to be out of whack. And then on the flip side of that, even if we have um, three or four or five rate hikes this year and then going on from there from the Federal Reserve as they have signaled, and I do not believe there will be that many for the record, I think there'll be two max three, but to the extent that we have anything near what they've signaled and to the extent that they dial back the size of their book by letting assets run off, or even if they decide to sell some, the amount that they have accumulated, which is more than double what it was going into the pandemic two years ago, and that's just the Fed, and you amplify that throughout the world with all the other major central banks, is ample uh, liquidity and usable liquidity for leverage in the financial markets. So these incremental changes and the fear that come from the Fed potentially pivoting or being hawkish or raising rates, the reality is, first of all, when growth stops, which it will, and when inflation, which was high into this messaging recently from the Fed, continues anyway, the Fed will pretty much dial back on its language and potentially on the speed of rate hikes as well as the speed of reducing or letting assets run off its book. As a result, the markets will have more um, sort of juice to them relative to the economy than they have right now. Okay, okay. Um, so let, let me just restate that because um, I think I know I think I know where you're going here. But um, so uh, to use the word distortion, Right, um, distortion sort of implies uh, that there's a force that is is you know stretching it from where its natural state is, and the danger of a distortion is that you know you can have a, a, a you know a reversion of the mean or a a you know a, a reconciliation of that distortion um, where you know things have to correct basically right, and I hear you saying look um, you know as economic growth continues to slow and and you know. The Atlanta Fed is tracking Q and GDP now, and they have it pegged at zero point one percent after a six point five percent growth rate in Q four, which is juiced by some inventory stuff. But still, that's basically economic stagnation, right? So um, we're already seeing that economic slowdown happen big time here in the states. Um, you don't believe inflation is going to be tamed anytime soon? Uh, I don't disagree with you. And you're basically saying you don't think the Fed can tighten all that much before it really threatens. Uh, you know, to kind of cause that that big corrective event that they really don't want to have happen here. So they're going to basically have to resume their easing ways. Uh, and you know, you think that's going to continue to juice financial price uh, prices higher again. Um, and yet that 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 increase in financial prices is happening on even smaller economic growth, right? So the distortions were even worse than it was before, right? I see a nodding as I'm saying this, but I just want to make sure I got it right. No, that, that, that's that's 100 percent right. I literally could have not said that better myself, um, Adam, in terms of just this idea, um, maybe classically of, of a distortion coming back and reverting to some sort of a, a normality. Um, and normalization is, of course, a term that the Fed uses, et cetera. The reality is that there is no resumption of a past normality. Um, the idea of this distortion just being its own, like, like jet propulsion, like, you know, we're out in sort of space and, you know, there's a black hole and the black hole doesn't generally get smaller. It just gets sort of bigger and deeper as it sucks more things into it. I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about or what I'm talking about when I, when I think of this distortion as being just a permanent positioning of just, just where we're at. And therefore it's, it's an ever increasing phenomenon. And, you know, as, as, as you said, you know, the, the Fed will, um, and and has want to keep the markets from freaking out. And and one of the things that that I heard and read um, after the last FOMC meeting, and and even in Powell's Q and A, and even though some of that was disruptive to the markets, um, because there is still going to be a lot of uncertainty and a lot of parsing together. What's the Fed really going to do? When is it going to do it? How is it going to position itself, et cetera, et cetera, which is going to cause volatility and chop in markets over these months to come, as as that come as that you know becomes fact, um, whatever it is they wind up doing. In the meanwhile, though, they will see that 
they will see that these, these growth parameters have slowed down. There are certain elements of inflation that might on average look more tempered, but, but for a, a uh, you know, if they're related to supply versus demand issues or whether they're related to just sort of the fact that we're not gonna increase it by as much as we increased it last year going into this period because it didn't come from such a low level. There's gonna be some mathematical sort of smoothing out, but for the real person dealing with real um, prices, there's, there's not going to be a, a reversion to, to anything anytime soon. The Fed knows this. Um, perhaps it doesn't admit it, but is watching for um, signs that it will need to perhaps not go back to easing mode right away, but certainly put the brakes on what it has signaled could be its tightening policy. Okay. Um, oh, this is so great. So number of questions here. Um, uh, you know, you, you you use the word distortions, you use the word permanent, um, and the word permanent distortions is going to come even more into play in just a moment here. Um, but I, I, where I want to go with this right now is sort of how how long can this continue? How 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 permanent can the Fed keep these distortions? And what I mean by that is the challenge that it's in right now, right, is if it um, if it tightens too much. It threatens to tank the markets and then bring the economy down even further, right? And that's something the Fed does not want to do. You know, maybe ideally it would like to engineer 20%-ish market correction over time and just give itself a little bit of wiggle room, but it doesn't want to tip things into a full-blown crash and, and put the US into recession. Um, on the other end, uh, it it you know, it can't let inflation continue to get out of hand here. Um and uh, so it's, it's stuck between a rock and a hard place, or as, as somebody actually said today on, on a live chat on a video premiere that I did, uh, the Fed is in a casket of its own making, which I really kind of like that turn of, of phrase here. Uh, but where I'm going is, is you, you also underscored, you know, even if the inflation numbers come down a bit this year, it goes from 7% to 4%, whatever, 3%, um, that's still not easing the burden that the average person is feeling, right? That the, the tremendous price increases that they've experienced over the past couple of years, um, it, those aren't reducing, just maybe the growth of, of, of that increase in cost of living is slowing a little bit, right? So at some point here, whether there's a, a, a market you know, limit, an economic limit, um, or perhaps a social limit, where we get to a point where the average person just says, I can't stand this anymore. And the torches and pitchforks come out. So, you know, can this last forever? What, what, what do you see as being the, the constraints of reality on the Fed's trajectory here? The current constraints are just that if what it's doing doesn't work, you know, it starts to raise rates by a bit, markets go nuts, the economy doesn't get impacted one way or another. Inflation is really not something it has control over with respect to you know, general everyday items or, or requirements from, from, from people relative to what they make. Um, and something else happens after that, you know, whether it is another wave of the pandemic, whether it is, you know, you know, sort of more of a, a threat of some sort of a war somewhere, whether it is a, a, a consolidated credit crunch because of a series of defaults, whether they're because we're at historically high levels of debt, both on a public government basis around the world, as well as on a corporate basis around the world, whether it's from a scandal that grows. You know, there's these areas that can at any point in time, you know, perk up. Um, hurt the markets in addition to the uncertainty with regard to what the Fed's doing in hiking rates. And the Fed's going to turn around at those moments and 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 back up because it, it can't not. Now, is there a limit to what the Fed can do if it chooses to go back in and help, which is, which is your question? Well, um, we have seen that there is no limit um, when there is enough reasoning and less scrutiny um, and no exit plan as, as to what the Fed and other central banks just did, which is, you know, yes, we had a, a, a pandemic, you know, once in a century and so forth. But on the other hand, it was like a really kind of enthusiastic, exuberant pouring in of liquidity with no sort of, hey, this is what we need for this reason. This is that. We'll dial. There was none of that. It was just like full on doubling of the Fed's book. And even before that happened, um, there was an increase in the Fed's book because there were some turbulence on Wall Street sort of beneath the scenes the average person isn't watching and doesn't see, see where the Fed was growing its book anyway by about 10 to 15 percent from its uh, prior six months uh, uh, before the pandemic even started. So, so, so there is no, there's no legal limit. 
So, so when does the outside um, person, I, someone who doesn't work at the Fed or doesn't work in Washington or isn't a major recipient of like trillions of dollars of leverage in the market personally, um, get annoyed and, and upset? I mean, I think we 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 will pass that point. Um, I I think the idea of sort of pitchforks in the street has been you know, transmitted into more decentralized finance online and to more of, you know, retail investors um, getting involved in the same financial assets that this leverage has basically pushed up and this abundant amount of money has pushed up and with this whole, if you can't beat them, join them mentality. And so there's this kind of financial revolution going on online um, that, that, that has become actually a part of um, the increase in markets as well around the edges. But, but this idea that, um, yeah, a friend of mine uh, who has this, this uh, well, everybody has an 18 year old person they know at some point, but you know, these people are coming into the markets, they're opening accounts. Um, and this is not even talking about Reddit and all the sort of meme stocks and everything else, but literally looking at um, the markets as a way to, um, maybe not articulate this way, but as a way to sort of deal with inflation, as a way to deal with the fact that the jobs might be there, as a way to deal with the fact that, hey, there's money to be made, I'm going to be involved, I'm going to learn about it more strategically. Um, and then there's a sort of new wave of people um, that are taking that sort of pitchfork idea through, um, through the actual markets that have kept the distortion going between them and the real economy. And all the technologies that have developed and will develop around that will sort of be a part of that, you know, that revolution, but um, technologically. Yeah, interesting. I, I was interviewing Michael Levery from Rabobank uh, two or three months ago, and, and he, you know, he basically sort of was rooting this on, saying, you know, um, one of the one of the you know most understandable responses from sort of the average person was to say, well, look, if this is these are the assets that the rich are using to get you know tremendously richer right now, given the you know the the, the help that they're getting from all the authorities with you know piling all the stimulus in and stuff like that. Well, then maybe I'll get mine too, and I'll stop working and I'll just do this. And so his it, his, his sort of thing was you know kind of almost rooting on this great resignation, <laughs> which is like, you know, all right, if everybody you know, adopts the same playbook as the, you know, the rich that are basically, you know, um, skimming off the system at some point, you know, all of a sudden it really sort of, you know, reveals the unsustainability of the system, right? Because it's essentially just sort of a wealth transfer that's been going on right now uh, away from the bottom 90, 90% into the, the pockets of the top 1%. Um, and so this is sort of a good way to protest, which is to say, okay, great. I'm just going to, I'm just going to use your playbook. I'm just going to copy you. Right. And, and I'm going to stop my productive work in the real world. And I'm just going to try to get my, my gains on the financial financialized part of, of uh, the system here. Now, of course, you and I know that, you know, that's not true long-term. There's no value creation going on there. Right. Um, and so that's not, something that's sustainable in the long term either. Um, but it's understandable, right? And I see you right. nodding here as I'm saying this. You know, I would say that the, um, I'd just like to hear your thought on this. So um, yes, you know, the, the authorities just piled gobs and gobs of, of uh, you know, fresh liquidity into the system over the past couple of years. A lot of it that, that honestly went straight to the few institutions that are benefiting the most from the whole system anyways. And I wanna dig more deeply into that with you in just a moment here. Um, but I would posit that they were, they were able to do that in a way that they're not able to do as well now, because back then inflation was still sub 2%, right? At least official inflation, right? So inflation does seem to be kind of a great limiter here that once it's, once it's really out of the box, uh, at a certain size, the options of the central banks to do what they've been doing in the past becomes a lot harder if their continued actions is going to feed that inflation as opposed to to reduce it. So how important is inflation as a rate limiter going forward? Well, I think optically and politically, it's it, it's it's definitely caused the Fed anyway. And um, before the Fed, the around the same time, the Bank of England, who raised rates before the Fed has raised rates, but has that same um, very high inflation that they're looking at um, within the UK. Other central banks a bit behind that because they're looking at, at a much lower inflation. Um, but 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 what you said about you know, sort of the general inflation idea is very important because what's going to happen is that numerically general inflation is going to sort of dampen out. 
um, whether that gets to four to three to two and a half to three and a half. The point is it's, it's going to on average look like it is less of a problem. The reality is before we all started talking about inflation, um, and back in those days when the Fed and other central banks were just pumping money into the markets and they were inflating. And I, I mean, I was was articulating this all over the place at the time. We have inflation. Just look at the markets. It's like not that we don't, but now it's um, more hitting people's pockets as a focal point. It has been hitting people's pockets all of these years, all of this time. It's just that on average, certain things have gone up now. We've had you know, supply chain disruptions. We've had the pandemic. We've had a, a mathematical relationship of how much inflation dipped to how much it's risen because of a multitude of factors. And that, that sort of mega number um, could dampen in which case the central banks um, can very easily shrug off again a lot of the tightening stuff or decide to look at other things. And if things get bad for whether it's the banking system, um, certain aspects of leverage in the markets or their own portfolios, I mean, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell's portfolio has been very, very well um, out yeah. of this particular period. I, I, um, I was looking at the number. I mean, it's literally more than doubled in the last two years. And so um, it's not like they're not aware um, that if they change their sort of actions dramatically, um, it doesn't just impact the markets, it impacts their market. Um, and so I think as a result of that, the, the, the idea of the limitations and everything else is, is really just a matter of, of, of time whereby we stop talking about it. Um, there stops being an aggressive change in, in posture. And even if there is a change in the US to an extent, you know, you've got the People's Bank of China that's going on the opposite direction that globally, we still have this abundance of cheap money that drive up financial assets. Yeah, so the torch will just continue to be passed from player to player on the, the global central banking stage. Um, all right, um, I, I wanna get my outrage on for a moment um, and you already did a good job there kind of stoking it, talking about Powell, um, but uh, uh, you know, we see the headlines about you mentioned Powell benefiting directly. We see the headlines about the Nancy Pelosi's of the world, right? You know who are you know basically sitting, seeing where the puck is headed, and and making lots of money, you know, placing trades in advance. We saw the the outrage in the headlines with the other um, Fed uh, officials uh, who have since resigned, you know, quote unquote for personal reasons, <laughs> um, but basically because they got caught, you know, and in, in, in a sense front running the Fed's uh, policy decisions. Um, so, uh, you know, the federal banks have been, have been doing their thing for a long time. Um, you've done an excellent job in the past of kind of writing how, you know, the, the, the big powerful players on wall street, um, you know, how they, they take the fed policy and they maximize it to their benefits. And as we saw leading up to 2008, they did it in a way that was pretty reckless in the sense that, that they, they just went after maximum, you know, profit potential for themselves and ended up basically creating so much instability that the system, you know, basically collapsed. Right. Um, are we seeing the same thing here at this time? Are, are, we, are we back to that type of excess where wall street has basically not learned its lesson um, leaned right back into these incredibly generous Fed policies. Um, and you know, we've seen asset prices shoot the moon here. Um, are we just basically seeing a redo of the excessive corporate advantage and greed that led up to the 2008 crisis? Yeah, I mean, a redo or just it's never stopped. I mean, however, how does we look about that? It's a, it's a trajectory. It's like a I, I guess they did pay themselves record bonuses in 2009. So, yeah, right. there really wasn't much of a hiatus, I guess. It's, it's like, um, yeah, it's like it's like the whole Groundhog Day every day, but like, you know, kind of on steroids. It's 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 been happening. And you know, we had record M&A figures last year and not even a record percentage increase relative to 2020. Just the fact that, um, you know, so Wall Street and um, the abundance of leverage, the abundance of, of, of free or cheap credit has has driven this whole new spate of, of M&A in different places. Private equity is now 20 percent of, of M&A, which is a very quick 
uh, rise to that sort of level, and that's only going to increase. And, and that particular part of the market doesn't have a lot of scrutiny or transparency in terms of what happens to companies along the way. And now it's kind of playing uh, as a component as well as on its own relative to the larger um, investment banks. You know, they've had record trading years. Um, this year, some of the banking stocks, you know, like JP Morgan, going to get back a little bit because their trading revenue wasn't quite as increased as it was before, but it's still up. I mean, all, all of these um, places of, of, of potential risk are happening and unfolding at exactly the same time in similar ways to, to how they've done before. It's just that there's more money in the system to play with. I mean, that, 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 that's just the reality. And even if, again, the Fed dials back any of it, it's still going to be more money to play with than it was in the wake of the financial crisis, going into the financial crisis, of course, of 2008, going into the pandemic, since the pandemic. I mean, there's still just more on the table to, to sort of work with. And the Wall, Wall Street is incredibly um, <laughs> flexible um, in terms of how it uses money. The only real threat to Wall Street in this, in, in this um increase, uh, constant increase um, in terms of risk taken and leverage used um, in different ways is, is sort of other players coming into the field, you know, more sort of the fintech, more sort of the decentralized financial, you know, whether it's crypto, whether it's um, systems that are just trying to take a piece out of, of some of its day to day business. But the, but the leveraged kind of business um, is something that it still is doing and using and that excess money is, is a great way to feed that. Yeah. All right. And I want to get in a moment to your thoughts on the ability of these new players, new technologies to, to maybe start eating some of, of, you know, old school Wall Street's lunch here. Um, but I do just want to tug a little bit more on this, which is, um, you, you know, buybacks have driven a ton of uh, share price appreciation over the past bunch of years. Um, that's been funded by the rock bottom interest rates that the Fed's been setting and the easy money that it's been pumping out in there. And as a result, we have companies that have way more debt on their balance sheets now, um, much higher debt to equity ratios than they used to have, right? And so we're, in some ways, we're sort of hollowing out the balance sheets of corporate America. And the people that are benefiting from the most from that are, you know, the investors and the executives who are basically, you know, selling their options, lining, you know, lining their pockets um, and being the first ones out the door before any potential reckoning happens in these companies. There's some statistic, I don't have the exact data, but it's something like more than 20% of, of corporations in America are zombie corporations, right? Meaning that they have to borrow to meet their debt service payments uh, and you know, prevent from tipping into insolvency and bankruptcy. Um, so, you know, these guys are kind of looting the system and making it much less stable. You referenced, um, indirectly what was going on at the end of 2019, right before the pandemic hit, where we had uh, another, you know, basically explosion of in the repo market, where um, the Fed was having to step in and basically um, let banks borrow trillions and trillions of dollars. And they never really explained why, right? But I, I think it's been added up that it was almost like $8 trillion um, was given to a lot of the major banks, um, you know, both in the U.S., but also some other international banks as well. And it really sort of smelled like, you know, the type of instability that we saw in 2008, where the system became a lot closer to imploding than was being admitted to. So, you know, again, is Wall Street bringing us back to the brink? Is its greed bringing us back to the, the brink here again, where we may find that there's some really systemic crisis uh, that just sort of comes out of nowhere, but it's because these guys were just you know, basically exploiting the system uh, for as, as much as they could for as long as they could. Yeah, I think, again, the fact that the exploitation, the, the sort of over leverage, the knowing that the Fed will be there um, quietly, as, as it were, back um, at the end of 2019, going into 2020 to sort of help them out, do their official job, which was, you know, one of the reasons that that whole repo situation was going on under the sort of radar was that, you know, banks are basically involved in giving sort of short term loans to their corporate clients so that the reach of Wall Street goes well beyond the banks themselves, you know, where, where there start to be problems is when that over leverage extends to their corporate customers, that over leverage goes from the big companies to the smaller companies, it becomes international, and that's where they are actually pushing that risk. Um, 
away from from them, but also more into the system. Um, and that's definitely happening. And will there be a moment where that all falls apart again? Um, it, it, it absolutely can happen. And, 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 and the way in which it would happen um, is that all of this extra, all these extra layer, uh, layers of debt, um, you know, as you mentioned, on you know, whether it's a zombie company on corporate balance sheets, on international um, balance sheets, uh, governments that are sort of not as able to produce money as the U.S. or some of the larger nations can, like all, all of this can create um, a ripple effect of, of risk. And Wall Street's always in the middle of it um, and driving it because the, the money first goes to them before it goes into the rest of the system. That doesn't mean that we don't have evolving um, a direct financing um, technologies and relationships and other companies growing into that space. But for the most part right now, that space is still controlled by the major Wall Street firms and, and goes into the rest of all of finance and all of sort of debt and equity relationships around the world. And that creates risk. And that means that if any part um, of that wall, you know, chinks and breaks, and then there's a storm going through it, and water rises over it. And any, anything that can happen to make that worse um, is set up um, because of, again, how much money um, and how little scrutiny over that money Wall Street continues to have. Yeah, it just, uh, yeah, it makes the blood boil. Thanks. You really, really did help me get my outrage on here, right? You there know, you it's go. almost like a, You're welcome. <laughs> it, it's a type of Cantillion effect, right? I mean, these guys yeah. get to take their gains today. They get to take their spoils today, and then they push off any potential losses into the future, and they distribute it across the system so that when it does happen, it's not necessarily impacting them nearly as much. So, grr, yeah. right? Um, now, you you mentioned that that's, you know, what they can get away with today, Um Let's talk just for a moment about some of these, you know, new technologies, DeFi, et cetera. Um, in layman's terms, you know, this is sort of the crypto space in many ways. Um, you know, it provides, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll let Nomi explain it better than I, but, but you know, the, the, the technology here does have the promise of being able to take out a lot of the banks as middlemen. Um, and to uh, handle the same types of transactions that go on in the financial industry every day, uh, cheaply, more effectively, more securely, et cetera. So there is potential here for these guys to sort of launch a better mousetrap and steal a lot of what Wall Street's making its spoils over. If you can just talk about how credible that threat is, and then, you know, I can't imagine the banks are going to give up their advantage lightly. So, you know, how is the empire going to try to strike back in the story? Yeah, that, 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 all of those are excellent points because, because the, the evolution is there. This interview with Nomi continues over in part two, which will be released tomorrow. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below, as well as the little bell icon right next to it. Be sure to click the like button too while you're at it. And if the major market distortions that Nomi detailed in this interview have you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your financial wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no-strings-attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your portfolio, keeping in mind the trends and risks Nomi has mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next in part two of our video interview with Nomi Prinz. Thank you.